ask, we will also be asking that you use the chat to um, ask any questions of Brenda, our presenter. Um, she will pause once during the presentation and once at the end for questions from you. Um, make sure your audio is off if there's any echoing or you can hear yourself. Um, I will try and keep track of your questions as best I can, and Brenda will try and answer them as best that we can. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to transfer it over to Brenda to get started. Thanks. Of technical questions, or if it's volume, you can uh, let us know through the uh, the uh, the chat. Okay. One thing that, uh, as we're just getting going here, I'd be pleased to hear. It's helpful for us to know for our numbers. If there are a number of you sitting around a, a, a computer, that'd be great to know. Just let us know who you are and uh, how many folks around the computer, and then we can add that to the to the numbers for this webinar. Seeing in the chat that some people um, are maybe not hearing yet, but um, I'm thinking we're, we'll just get get going on this. We're here to talk about the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporation Act, but before I get going. I'm going to say a bit, a bit about the people who are bringing this to you. Um, I'm hoping you're familiar with Sustainable 613. I'm not going to speak about that. I'm sure you can follow up with the organizers if you need to know a bit about that organization. I'm going to tell you a little bit about CLEO. That's Community Legal Education Ontario. It's a specialty legal clinic, and it's a legal publisher. It produces free, clear, accurate and very practical legal information. They have lots of hard publications and they have good websites and all of that information is free. So if you happen to work with marginalized people who could use some legal advice or if just if you need legal advice, I would recommend you to Clio's main site, which is clio.on.ca. The reason why Clio is presenting this project is that they were asked to do it by the Ontario Nonprofit Network. And I'll explain a bit more about what the ONN and their relationship with the Yonka. But the reason why Clio was uh, asked to do it is because of their expertise in public legal education. They have many projects, one on refugee law, um, a, a website that, that speaks to all kinds of areas of law. But this is their first project on nonprofit law. So uh, when uh, legal questions like the Yonka came up, um, it was uh, to Clio that they went. I should say, I'm wondering, I'm hoping some of you on the call already know about the Ontario Nonprofit Network, and if you don't, you should. It is uh, an interesting organization. They have a good free mailing list, and the membership is also quite reasonable. And I've been in the sector quite a while, over 30 years, and I, have just, I think this is our best chance yet for a group that's taking the voice of the sector to government. They have government at the table, and there's lots of interesting research, lots of interesting initiatives underway including lots for younger professionals in the nonprofit sector. So there's my, my two commercials for uh, Clio and for ONN. ONN has been active on this issue since the beginning, since there were first consultations on this law in 2007, and they've been carrying the voice of the sector forward since then. So before we get going on the meet, I wouldn't, I'd wouldn't like to know a little bit from you. I'm going to put a survey. Oops, wrong survey. Let's try this one. 
And I would like to know what you know about the ANCA already. If you're familiar with webinars, you may know what we need to do is just click in one of those boxes you should see on their screen. Um, and um, I'm seeing that some people are having trouble hearing me. I'm going to adjust this headset, and if it really doesn't work, I'll give up with the headset. So give me an indication in the, uh, in the chat if this is any better. If it isn't any better, I'll try without the headset at all, because it's important that you be able to hear it. But I'm hoping people see the survey on their screen, and I'm not sure I can see your responses, so I'll need an indication. But uh, what I'm trying to find out is what you know about the, uh, the ANCA already. Have you been to any other sessions? The Ontario Nonprofit Network did some, for example. Okay, I'm not seeing um, any responses, but I'm hoping that Amy or somebody can let us know um, who has, uh, um, uh, knows something about the ANCA already. Okay. I'm going to finish the survey, and uh, I'm hoping we're going to get some responses there. The reason I wanted to do a poll like that is because this is meant to be an introductory survey. It, uh, I'm hoping that uh, if you're experts, then I'm going to count on you to help us and um, be this is, uh, oh good, there's our responses, I see it now, I hope you do too, and that's good news. About 64% of you, it's the first presentation Anka, so that's great. We've got the right kind of audience for this webinar, but it looks that, that there's some people who've had some other exposure to information on this as well, so that's great. We can, we can count on that as well. The reason why I, as I mentioned, I did that, I'm going to go back to our slides now. And um, I want to tell you that this is um, ANCA 101. We're not going to be able to write your bylaw or answer detailed questions about your organization and specific uh, questions about your organization that might be hard to do too. I'm not a lawyer. None of what you're going to hear today is legal advice. How the law will apply to your, your organization may be different depending on your circumstances. And there may be some cases where we're gonna, you may need to go to a lawyer. But what I can do is tell you what the legislation says, and I can tell you what other organizations are doing about the law. So I'm hoping that's useful to you. My goal here is to convince you that it's worth your time to pay attention to the ANCA now, to do something about it now, and, and monitor developments as they come uh, about. There's some important things here that I think will affect uh, uh, virtually every nonprofit organization. And uh, in particular, there are some things that I think you should do before the law is proclaimed. I'll explain about that, probably at your next annual meeting, for example. So I'm going to highlight a number of areas to watch as it says on your screen, and that'll be a good chance to ask some questions. I want to encourage you that if you do have questions as we go along, write them in the chat room as we go. If I can, and it's relevant to what I'm talking about, I'll answer them as I go as well. So I'm, um, but I, I will pause and I'm gonna count on Amy to help me out when we pause in case there's questions that, um, that we haven't covered. So that's all for the overview. Now let's get started. I want to say a bit about how we got here. Uh, first of all, most nonprofits in Ontario are incorporated under the Ontario Corporations Act, under Section 3 in particular. That's a very broad act. It covers business co corporations as well, and it's an old act. It was first written in 1907. So we're due for some modernization of this. Um, it, th this act doesn't mention anything about email or electronic communications. It doesn't even mention telephone meetings. So as you can see, there's a reason to update this law. We have been talking about it since 2007, and as I mentioned, the Ontario Nonprofit Network has been putting together briefs, consulting with the sector, because there were considerable issues that were going to be difficult for the nonprofit sector to adjust to. I want to say a word, you may be confused about uh, federal incorporation and the Canada not-for-profit corporation. We've got two new laws for nonprofit groups coming out just at the same time. Federally, if you're incorporated federally, you're covered by the Canada not-for-profit corporations act. 
If you're incorporated in Ontario, you're covered by the ONCA, the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. The, the two laws are similar in some ways, but there's some considerable differences, one of which is the timing. We read a lot in the media about the CMCA, the federal law right now, because the deadline for continuance is coming up next year. The ONCA is different. Um, you're going to be deemed to be compliant whether you do anything or not, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, the ONCA legislation, Bill 65, was passed in 2010, but it hasn't been proclaimed, that's the legal jargon. It's not yet effect, and that's common with legislation. We get the legislation, then there's a time period when the forms and the regulations come, and we don't have that yet. We, right now, we are waiting for another bill, Bill 85, so don't get confused between 65 and 85. 85 is a technical amendments bill. It has all the changes to other statutes. There's 85 other laws that needed to be changed so that the ANCA could come into force. Bill 85, the technical bill, was introduced in June. We had hoped and expected that it would pass this fall. It hasn't passed yet. It's had first reading, but it hasn't um, uh, gotten on the order paper to be passed. And in fact, the Ontario legislature ra rises, it, it, it will stop its session this, this week, and it doesn't sit again until February. So it doesn't look like we're going to get it passed until at least uh, late winter or early spring. The government has said to us that, it will, that they have promised, in fact, that we'll have six months after Bill 85 passes before um, the, uh, the ANCA is proclaimed. That's useful because that way we can plan. We can know, have, a, have an idea and at least six months notice before the bill passes. But don't panic. Even when the ANCA is proclaimed, which now looks like it will probably be the fall of 2014, you still have, if you're an existing organization, you have three years to bring your, your bylaws and your other documents into compliance with the law. The law, provisions of the law will apply then, so if your bylaws were silent on something and there was a dispute, the ANCA's provision would apply as of the date it comes into force, but all the things in your bylaws that don't uh, um, uh, fit with the ANCA, you still have three years to fix them, to, to do what you want. Um, I. I wanted to say to you, I think it's a good good opportunity. It's premature to do all your fixing now because we don't have the forms and the regulations that contain some of the details. We won't have that until after Bill 85 passes. But it is a good opportunity. If you have to make changes to your bylaws, please make them with the ANCA in mind. We have most of the information, our site and the Ministry of Consumer Services site will give you that. And I want to say that you should do something. Just don't ignore it because although you will be deemed to be compliant, that's what uh, the Bill 65, the ANCA says, if you don't do anything, you, won't, you could be saddled with rules that don't fit you and you could also not know what your rules are. Because if you're deemed to be compliant, that means all the provisions in your, your bylaw that don't fit will be invalid, but you won't know what they are. And in addition, some mandatory provisions that you might not know about um, will start to apply. So that's my pitch for doing something. I want to say a word or two about uh, who's responsible, the Ministry of Consumer Services. That's who we're funded by, and, uh, and we're very thrilled by that. There's also contributions from the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration and from the Ministries of Tourism, Sport, and Culture. And there are resources already available at the Ministry of Consumer Services site. And my guess is on this call, there may be people who are in bilingual organizations. Many of you are in Eastern Ontario, and I, I know there are Francophone communities here. And I want to uh, refer you to the ministry site because all of their resources are available in French and English. This project doesn't have resources in French at the, at the moment, but there is help available in French. There's uh, the resources at their site that I'll talk about in a minute or two. And there's also an electronic toolkit that has things like a PowerPoint presentation and speaker's notes in French. So um, if you're here on this English webinar and want a little bit of extra support or be able to do more training in French, I refer you to that. And as I say, the, the links to those as we'll get there. Okay, moving forward. 
Does it have the Bronco or not? Um, I would say yes, it is. I've I've already spoken about the need for for uh, modernizing this. This will is going to make some things quite a lot easier. Uh, now we have in the right to incorporation as of right. That's the legal language. We don't have to wait for approval. Currently, you have to submit your documents to two government departments. Usually, the um, I think it's through Service Ontario and also to the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. And then we wait to see if, we, if they deem us to be uh, uh, correct. Now you can submit and if you, if you fill in the forms right, you're going to be able to, to be incorporated m much more quickly. And you can also do it electronically with, without all the paperwork that, that you currently have to do. Uh, this legislation now accepts things like electronic meetings. That's another uh, plus in the in the legislation. And there are a lot more rules in this legislation than there is in the old Ontario Corporations Act. But I think that's also a, a good thing because it gives more clarity to directors and to members. There's there's a, a, a detailed uh, process for conflict of interest. It defines it and what you have to do about it. There's much more clarity about uh, what directors' responsibilities are. There's a there's a defined standard of care now, and it's good news. It's that basically you act in the best interest of the organization and to the best of your abilities. So before it was unclear exactly what the standard was. And one of the most practical things is that there are lower, for very small organizations, there's a lower threshold uh, for requiring an audit. It's true that your funders may require, might, may be the reason you're really doing the audit, but there, at least if you're a small organization, you have some chances to not have to spend a lot on an audit. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more. So if you're thinking about changing, and I imagine since you signed up to the webinar, you are thinking about it, I want you to think first about how you want your organization to operate, how it operates now. I've been in the sector a long time. I know we often, the best way to clear a, a room is to say, let's talk about bylaws. And we don't w tend to want to talk about it. We want to talk about our, uh, the things that we're passionate about and the reason we formed the organization. But rules are important sometimes, and this, since we have to do something, this is our chance to get it right, to uh, make our bylaws suit us, to make the requirement to change suit us, rather than looking for the simple, quick, uh, this is what Anka, uh, the, the quickest and easiest way to get through, through this. So that's yet another commercial for, for uh, what we might want to do. Okay. Are you sure that the ANCA applies to you? If you are incorporated in Ontario under the Ontario Corporations Act, you are. But make sure you're not uh, incorporated federally first before you dive too deeply into this uh, because that's a different act, the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. However, there are organizations that are not, their governing legislation is not the OCA, the Ontario Corporations Act, but other special statutes, horticultural societies, agricultural societies, Conservation authorities, those are all groups that have their own law. But they are covered to the ANCA where their law is silent. So uh, their act will trump ANCA, but if their act is silent, then the provisions in the ANCA apply. So, uh, and as I mentioned, there's many rules, much more clarity, much more detail in, in the ANCA. So it's quite likely that these special statute corporations will be affected by the ANCA in, to some degree. Uh, one group of organizations that you might think would be covered uh, is, uh, but is not covered are cooperatives. Cooperatives are an example of another kind of organization that have their own law and so they are not covered by the ANCA uh, provisions at all. I should say that the ANCA is, it covers all kinds of nonprofits, including member benefit uh, organizations and something called uh, organizations, with, uh, nonprofits with share capital. That's things like golf clubs and uh, tennis clubs, curling clubs, uh, groups that have assets that are owned by their members. They're covered by the ANCA, but the rules for them are slightly different. I'm not going to say much more about them because I think most of the people on the call um, are, aren't that kind of organization. 
what you see on the screen are the areas that I think you need to pay the most attention to, and particularly the first one, the member classes and member rights. There are 250 sections in this law, so there's lots of rules, as I mentioned, but these are the ones that I think most people are going to want to, to look at, and I'm going to talk about each of these in, um, as we go along. And again, I tell you, uh, remind you to put your questions in the, in the uh, chat if there's anything that you're, you don't understand what I'm saying or you'd like more detail. I want to talk about member rights first. There are, in some members have a lot more rights under the ANCA than they did under the Ontario Corporations Act. And the, the model for the ANCA is borrowed, is business law, it's from shareholder rights. So a lot of the things that would be appropriate for minority shareholders in business and some of the impetus for this law came from cases where uh, minority shareholders felt uh, shut out, directors of a corporation took it in directions with no regard for what the members' interests were. But in our case, we, uh, in membership in a nonprofit organization is often quite different. Here's some examples of some of the things members can do. 5% um, of them can nominate directors. So some organizations have a very clearly what they'd like to do to, to nominate their directors and don't often, don't even ask for nominations from the floor of an annual meeting. That's not going to be possible anymore. Members do have the right to nominate. 10% of, of your members can ask for and get a special meeting. But uh, something that's new is that any member can make what's called a proposal in the law, and that proposal has to be included in your next member's meeting, in your annual meeting, and if there's material uh, to support it, you have to circulate this, this at the, uh, at the organization's expense. Now, there are some limits on this. There's conditions for what a proposal is. It has to relate to the affairs of the organization. You can't have dealt with it in, in the last two years, so that if there's somebody who has a particular issue that they just want to keep bringing up and bringing up, there are some controls. But uh, the right of members to, to uh, direct your organization, to put forward ideas, um, and perhaps to bind your directors is much uh, greater than it was before. Um, this might be a chance to go to uh, a survey. Now, we, we won't answer all of these questions right now, but I would like the, you to, to respond to, do you have more than one kind of member? Do you, do you have honorary members? Do you, have, do you call your donors members? Do you have voting and non-voting members? And do you have... Um, uh, uh, is, it defined, is your membership carefully defined? So if you would take a moment just to respond to the question at the top, the member one, and also then if you're ready, one thing that the ANCA does is that it, it, it proxies the ability to give your, your vote to another, or another person is required. I'm curious what your practice is right now. Do you allow pro proxies? Um, in the ANCA, proxies are mandatory, and in fact, you, you don't have to give your proxy to another member, anybody. And I'm hoping you can see the other uh, uh, question on the screen. Uh, the length of the term, we will get to that, but I'll, I'll ask you the question right now. What term do your board members, there's some changes to this in the ANCA, and I'm just curious to see what the practice is of the people who are on the call. The last two questions, well, the next question deals with financial information. Again, I'll get to the, talking about the detail of it, but I'm curious to know what your practice is. Um, so do you have, do you have a, a full audit of here or not? And the last question here is about non-voting members, and that I will get back to the presentation and tell you a bit more about that. Do you have people who you call members but that don't actually have the right to vote? Honorary or perhaps advisory people, things like that. So I'm hoping you've had some uh, time to respond to it. I'm seeing some people have only seen a couple of the questions. I'm going to move the screen up just in case this helps, and I'm hoping you can all take a, or uh, if you can scroll down, I'm going to give it a second or more to, I'm hoping you're able to respond, because I'm soon, this is last call, because I'm going to uh, 
close the survey in a second if everybody's had enough time. I appreciate this is helpful to me to know so that I just don't talk at you and I can tailor my remarks to what you need. Okay, if I'm hearing no objections, maybe I'm going to give it a second or two more. I'm going to go back to member rights in a minute. And folks, I think I'm going to finish the survey so we can see what the responses are. Okay. I'm going to get the response to go back to my slides so you can see that. All right. I asked you all those questions because I wanted to tell you a bit more about members. Um, I've already spoken about the rights of members, that members have the possibility to be a lot more active. So this can be important if you have that want to take your, your organization in a, a certain way or not. The other thing that's new under the ANCA, ANCA is these uh, things called member classes. If you call your members by different things, the ANCA is going to call them a member class. That's important because, first of all, they now have to go in your articles. That's the equivalent of what your letters patent are now, and that's your founding document. It's difficult to change. And they have special rights as a class. They essentially have a veto on changes to the conditions of their class, uh, uh, conditions like how much voting power or what the price is to get in or any other condition that relates to their membership. So that's important and that's why I've been saying you will probably want to look at your membership now before the law comes into, into force because once the law, the day that the law comes into force, your different classes of members will have to agree to any changes as a class. So if you had youth members and you didn't want to have them anymore, the youth members as a class would have to agree to that. So if, if nothing else, it's going to be administratively more difficult. You're going to have to have all the resolutions and note to the responses by member class. That's why we're saying this is if one thing to take away from today is look at your membership to structure and decide whether or not you're happy with it. If you want to make changes, you probably want to do that at your next annual meeting before the ANCA is proclaimed important is that members have much more access to information. They, uh, you have to give them copies of your articles and bylaws uh, and financial statements. That's not terribly new. Some of that's available already. The, the thing that's new is that any member can get a copy of your members list. You have to be avail ready to give any member on request a copy of your members list with contact information. So. Uh, it's not clear in the legislation what, what contact information is. I, 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 what people have been assuming is that email might be good enough for contact information because no one is, is very anxious to give out street addresses and that kind of detail for people. And everyone always says to me, well, how can that be? Isn't there privacy legislation? Well, this trumps privacy legislation because by joining an organization, you're deemed to have given consent to sharing your contact information with other members. The logic is that because members have powers to put forward ideas, you, members need to have some way to contact other members to put forward their ideas. So um, that's a, uh, uh, when I say this and I often see in, in when I do events in person, I pe people sort of pasted back in their seats saying, Members can't opt out. We always ask people if they want their information shared with others. That's our, our practice now because of PEPIDA and our privacy legislation. But this is one area where the, that won't apply. There are limits to uh, um, how members can use that information. And in fact, in the legislation, there's a formal procedure called an undertaking that if members want the members list, they have to agree to use it under these conditions, that it, it relates to the affairs of your organization, um, and that it's not a personal, you can't use it to promote your business, all that. But, I, but what people have told me is that they're worried about misuse of this. Even if people sign this undertaking which protects the information, then uh, if, if they misuse it, then the damage is done, and you can't take, put the genie back in the box. 
So at minimum, you probably want to look at this. You probably want to inform your members that this might happen. So I see one question. I'll, I'll respond to that right away. It's only members. Members would have access to the contact information of other members. Not You don't have to make it uh, available to the public. But with people, groups who have large member or, uh, memberships, um, they're worried. I've been speaking with groups with people working in family violence or with small children and things like that, and they're very concerned about this. I see one other question here. If you have clients who utilize your service but are not currently considered members, will they become members under the legislation? That's up to you. If you call the members now, um, then they, are, they will be members. And that relates to what I said about member classes. If you call your members different things, um, and there's two things here. What do your bylaws say and what is your practice? So both could apply. Your bylaws are your primary document, but if you have a practice, whether your bylaws say it or not, of recognizing on your website all these different kinds of members, I think it would be reasonable that you'll be required to call them member classes. Okay, I'm, since we're talking about members, I'm just going to see if there's any other questions about membership before we go forward on members. I don't, I'll depend on Amy to resend me anything if there's anything, otherwise I'm going to keep on going. I've already mentioned proxy um, and I've mentioned the in access to information. And directors too. Um, and I've mentioned that some of them I think are good news because it's much clearer what the responsibilities are. Uh, one thing that's new is that up till now, generally your number of directors was in your bylaws. And that's not something you have to submit to the government. It's something you can change more easily. Now the number of your directors has to be in your articles, which, as I said, was, is the same as your letters patent. Um, and it's not clear what the form of the articles will be because we don't have these regulations yet, but we're a bit concerned because opening up articles is, can be difficult and even risky for, for charitable organizations. I'll speak to that again in a minute. But uh, the good news is that you don't have to have a fixed number anymore. You can have a range of directors. So if it's helpful to your organization to uh, your organization may change or that you only at some point you might only want four directors another point you might want 15 that is now allow, allowed uh, one change uh, under the ANCA the ANCA allows directors to be employees but if you're a charity or a wannabe charity it's not allowed by charity law that's one example where uh, the ANCA is trumped by other other uh, regulation and other law uh, I'm speaking about organizations incorporated in Ontario. If you're a charity, that uh, regulation happens from Canada Revenue Agency and they have their own regulations. And there's also a body of case law, charity law, that have made decisions that have uh, given us what the rule is. And this is one of those examples. Charities can't have directors who are employees because it's seen to be a, a conflict of interest. You can't direct the organization and also be a, um, um, a, an employee and be paid by the same people. This is a good point to mention that their directors and members are not the same thing, although they can be the same people. Uh, the, uh, I talk to people who say, oh, we don't have any members, and that's not true. Every nonprofit organi organization has had to have members. If you don't think you don't have members, then your first members were probably the people who signed your incorporation documents, which were probably your first directors. Members and directors have distinct roles. Members' primary role is to vote, direct the organization. The directors manage the organization. They make the, the more of the day-to-day, -day, or at least the month-to-month -month decisions. So it's quite common though where your your only members are your directors and that is a choice. One thing that's new in the ANCA is that directors do not have to be members. I, and I believe in the ANCA that was the case. But now you can uh, have members and have directors who are not members. Or in your bylaws you can require directors to be members. 
One other new thing is that it's quite common at an annual meeting that you pass a resolution that the directors can fill vacancies in the Board of Direct between annual meetings, between member meetings. That's still allowed, but now there's a limit. You, uh, directors can only fill up to one-third of the number of directors that were elected at the last annual meeting. So the logic of this is that um, if, um, say, there was uh, a problem, um, a dispute, and most of the board resigned, the directors that were left couldn't fill the entire board with people who agreed with them or their friends without referring back to the members. So, and also if you only elect a certain, in some organizations, you might have 12 directors, but with three-year terms, you only elect four in one year. In that example, you can only elect one third of the four, so essentially one, because you can't elect a fraction of a person. So this is quite nitty gritty details, but um, I give you some of those examples to show that it's worth your while to compare what you, your practice is now by what will be allowed under the ONCA. Okay, I'm going to go back to to some of the questions in the chat. I see someone has asked, does a nonprofit have to have members? Yes, I had. I went back to the lawyers on this one, and the, essentially the reason is because the onc. This was the, you did have to have members under the OCA too, but the rights of the members were different. Uh, and the real reason you have to have members is to, to play the role that the legislation requires members to do, accept financial statements. Um, and I'd have to check some of the others. That's one of them, elect the directors is likely another. So uh, you, you only have to have one, <laughs> but you do have to have members. And as I say, that should be distinct from the role of the directors, although your only members can be your directors. So Tamara is asking, how difficult is it to change membership in articles? Well, um, the, the, the distinction here is that the member classes are in, will now be in your articles under the ANCA and the member conditions. So uh, what it takes to be a member and uh, what it takes to be a different kind of member are in now will be in your bylaws. So your voting powers, uh, fees if there is anything, uh, all that is still in your bylaws. So bylaws are easier to change. It takes, um, the members can do it with, uh, I believe, just simple majority vote. Articles are hard to change. They usually require um, at least a two-thirds vote of the members. And this is maybe an opportunity to, to speak about uh, why changing your articles is a big deal and you should be careful about doing it. They are your founding documents. They include your, your office. Uh, your head office, and they also include your purposes, and this is a crucial point. And if you're a charity, you have to submit any your purposes and any changes to your in your articles to the Canada Revenue Agency, the the regulator. So, and charity law has evolved over the years, so it's possible that what was approved and thought to be charitable when you first applied and you got your status is no longer charitable under law. So the risk is losing your charitable status. Now, uh, we don't know yet until we see the regulations whether everybody is going to have to submit uh, revised articles to CRA, the regulator, or to, in Ontario, uh, uh, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee has a role in regulating charities. We're hopeful that people, uh, if you're only changing to put the number of the directors in and the member classes in, and you don't touch your purposes, that you won't have to resubmit. We don't know that yet. That, but what we do know is uh, be very careful and probably get legal advice if you're going to change your purposes because of the changes in charity law that have gone along. So I hope that answers whether it's difficult. How long it takes, I can't really tell you, but I do know you need to submit and you do have to wait for approval, so I'm thinking that takes a while. Shane is asking me to comment on the differences between the ONCA and the Federal Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. Um, I'm no expert on this. Um, uh, the, the major change, that, at least the most obvious one, is the deemed provision. Under the CNCA, um, you have to file articles of continuance, it's called, in order to keep existing. Um, you, you are dissolved if you don't do that by the deadline, which in the, for the federal law is next October. In the Ontario law, um, if you don't do anything, you're deemed, uh, all the provisions that don't match the ANCA are deemed to be invalid, but you keep going. 
So that's one of the, there are lots of other different uh, small changes too, like uh, the financial review and audit things are different. Um, there are some other changes. There's uh, lots of resources on our website now of people talking. Some people say they, if you have to redo something, that, that you should pick the domain that you want to be in, whether you want to incorporate uh, um, federally or not. So, so if you go to our Learn More site, uh, Learn, Learn More page, you'll find some people who are speaking about the differences in detail. Okay, Tamara is asking, so are you able to change the membership definitions and classes in your bylaws prior to changing them in your articles? Um, yes. And in fact, that's what we're advising to do, is using the rules you have now, using the bylaws you have now, look at your member structure and make it what you want it to be. Then maybe you don't have to change your articles. If you have uh, only one, well, I guess you still have to put a membership class, because you do have to put, even if you have one class, it will go in your articles. But you won't have this issue with get the vetoes of member classes. So yes, you definitely can do that. And Dick's asking, is it possible to convert from federal to provincial incorporation and what is involved? There I would want to refer you to some of these more detailed articles, uh, and we've linked some of them on our website. I've heard Mark Bloomberg is one. You could go to his site because he, he, he thinks the answer is for people to incorporate federally. Like, there's quite a debate on this. Uh, I can't really have an opinion. It's certainly... I don't know wh whether you have to let your Ontario incorporation lapse. The details of that I'm a little shaky on, so I better not speak to that. Okay, great question. Thanks. Keep them coming. I'll deal with them as I can. Let's go on to another area. This is a new term we've got under the ANCA, Public Benefit Corporation. If you know the federal law, and the same thing in the federal law is called a soliciting corporation. But in the ANCA, this is a new definition. And the good news is, if you're a, reg if you're a charity, or a charity at law, whether you're registered or not, that maybe is a nuance you don't really have to worry about. If you're a registered charity, you don't have to worry about this. You're always a public benefit corporation. But if you're not registered for some reason, uh, the definition hinges on the source of your funding in any one year. If you get public funds, and public funds are government funds, but it's also funds from people who are not your members, employees, or families of, the, of your employees. If you get over 10000 in one year, that makes you a public benefit corporation for that next year. There are different requirements for public benefit corporations. That's why it's important. However, in the next year, if you don't get any public funds, you wouldn't be uh, considered to be a public benefit. You'll be a non-public benefit corporation, that's what they call it. So there's nothing stopping people who get public funds uh, to meet the requirements of a public benefit corporation all the time. That might be simplest, uh, but uh, you, don't, you may go between the status. So this is just something to be aware of and you perhaps decide whether you're going to meet the requirements of a public benefit corporation. Some examples of that is uh, you have to have a minimum of three directors. That's, that's actually not new. But you can't have employees, that, more than one-third of employees as directors. The ANCA, as I said, does allow you to have employees as directors, but charities you can't and public benefit co corporations can. And there are some differences in the audit requirements, which I'm getting to. Uh, one other big difference, if you're a public benefit corporation and you close down, your assets have to go to another public benefit corporation. Okay, moving on. Now to talk about the audits and the financial reviews. First of all, uh, both audits and financial reviews are done by qualified auditors. There's no difference there. And this has to be an independent auditor. It can't be a member of your organization. People are interested in financial reviews or review engagements, they call them sometimes too, because they're cheaper. The reason they're cheaper is that the auditors look at your statements and your records and they ask, uh, are they plausible? Do they seem to confirm to generally accepted accounting principles? But they don't do any testing. So uh, the assurance is, is less than if they actually do the, uh, the testing that's involved in an audit. That's also why they're cheaper. We have new rules uh, allowing people to have a financial review because the cost of audit have, audits have been going up quite a lot and sometimes 
you spend more money on the audit than, than what you might be getting from the grant or whatever. That's the other thing to say right here. No matter what the legislation says, what your funder says probably rules. I've been asked, well, will the funders change their requirements based on uh, what's now in the legislation? Who knows? Certainly they're looking at it, but they may have their own reasons for keeping their audit requirements where they are right now. One, whatever you decide to do, if you decide you want a lower uh, level of financial uh, review, you have to get permission from your member. So you have to plan ahead. Uh, so in the annual meeting before you want to do this, you'd have to put forward a solution, uh, resolution. It has to be an extraordinary resolution, they call it. That means that 80% of the people who uh, vote on it at the meeting would, uh, would have to agree. So the members have to know that you're doing this and that they agree with it. The next slide has the rules for this. Essentially, if you're a tiny organization and you bring in less than 100000 a year, your public benefit, you can waive vote. You still have to report to your, your members or your financial statements. That's in the, the, what you have to do at an annual meeting is in the legislation now, but it could be an internal report. It wouldn't have to be um, externally uh, verified. If you make under 500000 in your public benefit corporation, then uh, you can have a review, again, this, this review by a chartered accountant. If you're non-public benefit, you've got, you've got more flexibility. If you bring in under 500000 you could waive both. So I'm hoping that that deals with the, uh, the the rules on financial audits. So here's a good chance to pause for questions again. I put on uh, the screen some questions that you might want to think about, and I see that a few people. There's at least one more question. Um, oops, maybe not. Looks like I'm good so far. So if we are good so far. Um, I'll come back to your questions in a second. I'll take the chance to go forward and say, what on earth can you do about this? First thing you should do is get your ducks in a row. Gather your documents. And by documents, I mean your, that means your letters patent. That's what they were called under the Corporations Act. This is your founding document. If you can't find them, you can get them from uh, the government. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's on our site yet, but we'll try and provide, you know, where do you go and ask for these things. And if there's been changes along the way since you incorporated, those are called supplementary letters patent, and you need those too. Those will turn into your articles and your, and your articles of amendment. That's the, the words in the, in the new legislation. You also need your bylaws, and your bylaws w would not have been uh, filed with government. There's an internal document, and you need to know if they've been amended over the years. So uh, check the minutes of your annual meetings, were there amendments? And on top of your bylaws, what do you do? What's been your practice? Because it's, I know from working in this sector, it's quite common that not, people don't always go to their bylaws to check, they just go ahead. And so if you've been operating in a different way, as I said already, this is your chance to make your, your rules match what you're doing. The other thing you want to do is to monitor. I've, I've mentioned the number of the areas that are changing. Uh, I hope, if you haven't al already, that you'll go and uh, subscribe to the eBulletin at the Get Ready for the Anka website. The link's coming up. We'll tell you when Bill 85 passes. We'll tell you when we have a uh, date for the Anka to be proclaimed. And we'll let you know uh, there's a few things that, that are still unclear. In fact, there's a few things we're still hoping to change. And so we'll let you know our progress on that. Uh, the most practical thing you can probably do right now is look at what's mandatory uh, and look at what you, what you get if you don't do anything. And look at the options or the alternate rules you can have. We're uh, going to be producing some resources on this, but um, ma proxies, for example, are mandatory. The member rights, you, can't, you have to, to give people member rights as I'm, I'm describing them. And that's what leads me to that you mostly want to look at your member structures right now because it'll be much easier to change them this year under your current rules than it will under the new, rule, uh, new rules. Okay, looks like we got a couple more questions. For Muffy's asking, for extraordinary resolutions, is it 80% of membership or 80% of those who attend the AGM? It is 80% of those who vote who attend the AGM. That brings up the question of quorum. 
in order to conduct business at your annual meeting, uh, you have to see what your rules are right now for quorum. You have to have a certain number of members present for your quorum. That's one of the default rules in the ANCA. Quorum for members' meetings and for directors' meetings, if you, if you don't change it, it's, it's simple majority. It's 50% of your members. So I know from working in the sector, most groups don't, don't often get all your members out to a meeting. Sometimes it's a struggle to get a few out. So people set their quorums fairly low in many cases so that they can conduct business. So in this case, the extraordinary resolution, um, it, to get permission, for example, you'd have to make sure you have quorum of members, then 80% of the people who are there. And Muffy's asking about electronic votes. And yes, they are. I didn't mention that. I should have uh, in relation to proxies. Because proxies are mandatory uh, and because proxies can be given to people who aren't members, people have been uh, thinking about this. Electronic voting is serves as a, as a proxy. It's, you just have to give people a way to vote if they can't attend the meeting. So there are some issues about electronic voting you may need to think about. Um, like for, will you need to verify whether the person has the right to vote or not? Uh, is, will there be secret ballots requested? If so, how would you do that? Some groups uh, are thinking, well, maybe there's a third party that could um, uh, verify uh, even by from a list of num um, uh, membership emails, something like that, and actually tabulate the vote so that the organizers aren't the per people um, actually conducting the voting so that it is uh, transparent and so people trust it and don't believe that people would abuse it. So yes, electronic voting is certainly uh, um, allowed and my guess is that's what most people will do for proxies. Okay, any rules, Mary, Rosemary asking, any rules regarding chartered accountants versus uh, certified general accountant and levels of government funding? I don't think I can speak to chartered accountant versus certified general accountant. I'm not sure of the distinction. I do, the legislation does say that it's, um, I forget the wording, but it's uh, uh, someone uh, authorized to do audit. So I, I'd have to send you to the accountants to, to uh, see if there's a difference between those two designations. Levels of government funding. Um, if you, that comes back to your definition of public benefit corporation, if you receive over 10,000 from any source, including government, then these rules about audits and financial reviews kick in, and that's different from the requirement of your auditor, of your funder for an audit. In most cases that people have been telling to me, they say, forget the legislation. My funder is requiring an audit. Uh, it won't make any difference to me. So you will have to check with your funders about what, what they're going to require. I suppose you can make the case that if the ANCA has different requirements, could they not align them? But I, I can't speak to whether funders will change. Okay, Tamara's asking, uh, I too am also wondering about electronic votes for motions and if the sample bylaws on the ministry's website for this is efficient. I haven't looked at that in particular, but thank you for mentioning the sample bylaws because uh, I didn't speak much about them and they are an important tool, but a tool with, with some um, things to be aware of. There is a default bylaw on the Ministry of Consumer Services site right now. It's um, a very simple bylaw. I, I've told you already that there are many more rules in the ANCA and there are two ways to do bylaws. Uh, you can do a very simple one and then refer to the legislation. All the rules in the legislation apply and you only specify what you need to in your bylaws. Right now, most people have more extensive bylaws because up till now you had to say every power that the corporation could do. That's a change now. We the, the in the ANCA, you have the corporations have the rights of a natural person, meaning you, if it's not anything that a person could do, a corporation could do. That wasn't the case before, so that's why BALA had to state all these things like borrowing powers and a bunch of things that there was all this boilerplate. If you've done bylaws, you've probably seen it. Um, the default bylaw is quite simple because it depends on all the rules in the legislation. It's also written for all kinds of nonprofits, including member benefits. There's a number of things in that bylaw that are probably not suitable for, for nonprofit uh, community benefit organizations. And there's some things that are just 
um, details that people will want to look at, like the terms of directors, for example. The default term in the sample bylaw is, is one year. That doesn't really speak to uh, the, the, the question that Tamara asked exactly about electronic motions. I'm not, I'd have to go and read that myself. Uh, but nonetheless, you don't have to take the default bylaw idea. It's a good tool to start from but you probably might need to go to the legislation as well. We're trying to come up with uh, tools to help people do this. Uh, you don't have to do it yet, although if you're opening your bylaws, then it's good to do it with, uh, with the ANCA in mind. Okay, Dick's asking, when we completed our current incorporation, there was an online te template that covered key details and allowed us to cut and paste to create articles. Does similar to exist for the new ONCA? I'm assuming you, you probably incorporated federally under the CNCA, uh, and it's called the Bylaw Builder. I've just been doing focus groups, and I asked people about that, and everybody loved it. So uh, it would be good to hear from you, Dick. Did you find it very helpful? We're wondering whether to recreate it in Ontario um, and, and the cost versus the benefit. To do the interactive, they have two versions on the federal site, one where you, uh, you go back and forth, and then they also have an option where you can just print all the possible languages, and then you decide what you want to do. So, Dick, I see you typing. I'll be pleased to hear, uh, did you use the print all options or did you use the back and forth and do you think we need it for Ontario? Because we're working on that right now. Uh, people that in the focus groups did like it. Okay, if there's more questions, um, I encourage you to keep going on that. It's just one or uh, two more uh, uh, things. To, well, actually, we're pretty well done here. It's just a few um, links and such that I want to, to bring to your attention before we finish. We're getting up to our time. Okay. I have uh, mentioned that the Ministry of Consumer Services site has lots on it and it also has it in French, so I encourage you to go there. And I've also given you the link here to the legislation. And as I said, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I've learned all this as a practitioner. And I, have, uh, I love going to this legislation site because if you use control find in your browser, you can find what it says about quorum or about directors, whatever. So I encourage you, if you have specific things, um, do that yourself. Don't use the find box that's on the page because that'll take you to other bills. But use the find in your, fun in your browser and then you'll find the instances of those words. And so I found that a great tool. And here's a, a few more links. Um, I really hope you'll subscribe to our e-bulletin. You can unsubscribe anytime if you find it too much. And I also encourage you to go to the Ontario Nonprofit Network site because the history of this this bill, uh, why things are the way they are, the ZONN has managed to get changed, the other things they want to still change, that's all there on that site. There's also some case studies of how they think this will, um, will affect it. So I see that, that Dick responded and said that he liked the, the, uh, the, um, his experience on the federal site. And glad to hear that you could do it in an afternoon site. That's a testimonial. I'll put that in and we'll try and and see what we can do on Ontario side. It'd be nice if government did it, because government did do it on the Industry Canada site, but um, we'll figure out how we can make that happen. Okay, I, I'm winding up. If there's no other questions, I want to thank you for your time and for your active questions. You've had, had some good questions with us, and I encourage you to uh, keep in touch with us through our e-bulletin or if there's, there's something specifically I can help you with. What, and I'll mention, I'm, I'm happy to do webinars for this for other groups. We like to get a fairly large group together, but because there's no travel and such, it's, it's an easy way for me to get the information out. So you can spread that in your network. Okay. I'm seeing people asking for the site backup. I'm not, I'm not positive. Ah, maybe it's people need the links. Fair enough. Um, these links are all on our site too, which is at nonprofitlawclean.on.ca. I just wanted to thank everyone for attending on behalf of Sustainable okay. Ontario. Okay, and people, people asking, is there a cost to get you to offer another webinar? No, I, I, you, you can get me for free, but you have to pay for the webinar. And of course, it depends on schedule and such. There's a number of requests. But, and we generally ask for a minimum of 50 participants. 
So that's what we're basically asked for. Since this is an introductory webinar, because some of the details aren't set, we, once the details are set, we'll be able to be more helpful and we'll also have more resources. So we'll probably have a more detailed plan for education once the details are set and that will be in the new year. Okay. Thanks everyone. If there's nothing else, I'll hand it back or say goodbye, whichever is more appropriate. Um, thank you all for attending on behalf of Sustainable Eastern Ontario and thank you Brenda for putting on um, this presentation for us. Hopefully it was helpful to everyone and um, as was mentioned in the chat before, a uh, recording and the slides should, will be available on our website in the near future. Um, so again, uh, thank you and that's all.